Salutations to the Truth Core, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. This is once again John Lash, founder of Nemata, the Sophianic School of Arts and Sciences. And so, and so what? So what if I am? Just asking for a friend. Well, it so happens that the Sophianic School of Arts and Sciences is a modern mystery school. So perhaps I could take a moment to elaborate on that statement and hang with me because it does lead directly into the main topic of this little message, which is a message about truth. Do you know what the Greek word for truth is? Aletheia. Aletheia. It's a beautiful word. And it has in it the root T H E. I, which is related to the root, to the Greek word for beholding. Do you know that the word theoria in Greek, in the ancient Greek of the Gnostics, and Greek was more or less the lingua franca of the mystery schools, the word theoria in those sanctuaries of wisdom stood for a particular and specific event. So theoria in the Gnostic sense, then and now, is not theory. Theoria is beholding. But the question is, again, just asking for a friend, beholding of what? That's the mysterious part, you see. So the Gnostics used the word aletheia in the sense of the sacred knowledge of beholding something, actually beholding it, like you behold whatever is in front of you right now. And that act of beholding was the central experience of the pagan mysteries. And it is also the foundation of the living Gnosis today. The Gnostics had a standard of truth that was based on an event, an act of beholding. And that act can only be experienced in Gnosis, which is cognitive ecstasy. You see, there are certain things that can only be known by the human mind in a state of ecstasy, in a state of bliss. So bliss is not merely a feeling of exquisite pleasure, but it is a cognitive experience. And all of Gnosis is based on that premise. So to the Gnostics, aletheia was truth. But was it the truth? What's the difference between truth and the truth? I like that question. It provides me with the opportunity to offer you a jewel, at least I consider it to be a jewel. In all my years of learning, reading, searching, investigation, experimentation, this is one of the jewels that I have found on my path. And actually, I found this jewel in India 
I found it in the writings of those Vedic yogis who stood behind the Buddha who came out of the Vedic tradition. And so you find the formulation of this gem, it is a proposition, in Buddhist literature. And as such, I can assure you that it is like the proverbial gem in the garbage heap, because Buddhism is garbage, and it's also passé. But there are a few jewels in the garbage heap of Buddhism, and here's one of them. Philosophers of India made a distinction between two kinds of truth. You can translate it probably in the most user-friendly way, like this. There is the conventional truth, and then there is the absolute truth. And they have two specific words in Sanskrit for these two kinds of truth. First word is samvritti. That's conventional truth. What samvritti means literally is according to the impressions of things. You could stretch it a little and say, according to the evidence. Vritti is the evidence, it's an impression of something. Vritti means vibration. You can hear it in the word. So samvritti is the qualification of conventional truth. And I submit to you that it's extremely helpful useful to call that the truth. When you say the truth, it immediately directs your NLP, your mental synapses, your linguistic circuits of your brain to something specific. So the truth is always about something specific. For instance, what is the truth about the Kennedy assassination? What is the truth about World War II? What is the truth about the Great Reset? So the conventional definition of truth carries a responsibility to look at evidence and to form conclusions based on the appearances and impressions of things and events, you see? It's quite specific, it's quite simple really. To go to the full expression, you add the Sanskrit word for truth, which is satya. So that is the equivalent of the Greek aletheia. So you have conventional truth samvritti satya that is the truth about anything in which you choose to inquire so what about the other truth what about that one the absolute truth or ultimate truth as i prefer to say the expression for that is Paramatha Satya. Paramatha Satya. And Parama means ultimate or extreme, like paramount. Artha means the thing. So it's the truth of the ultimate thing. And what is the ultimate thing? Well, when you see it, you know what it is. That's what's mysterious about the mystery school. But it's an open secret, and I've talked about it a lot. The point I want to make here is that this distinction provides the opportunity to consider 
that there is an ultimate standard of truth. The truth is not the same as truth. The truth is diverse, but truth is unity. Truth is unity. And Mamma Mia, don't we need some unity right now in the truth core? And we have needed it for a while. So what I'm offering you is my little fix, is my little notion, is my pet idea about ultimate truth. So let me see if I can get it across fast and easy, like a pool hustler. I am a pool hustler, by the way. So maybe I got a chance of succeeding. Now, I don't presume that I know what you're thinking. But I do know something about philosophy. And when you look at the record of philosophy, you can see that a lot of it has consisted, a lot of good philosophy, genuine, has consisted in a search for ultimate truth. Philosophy is not about the truth. The, the, the truth is always something factual and existential. We may hold different views about the truth, about 9-11, for instance. I personally, having, have it, having had the privilege to talk through long hours of the night with Dr. Judy Wood, am convinced that DWs were used on I-11, where seven buildings were destroyed. Not two, not three, seven. You may have different views. The truth can be diverse, and the truth that you hold can separate you from me. It can cause us to have differences and to argue with each other and disagree. But that's okay. We can disagree about the truth. What we can't do is disagree about truth. Now you might think that truth or establishing truth in the ultimate sense is a philosophical or metaphysical game. But it isn't. No, it isn't a metaphysical game. And yeah, it must be said, I'm going to say it anyway, that it is a kind of game. It's like the glass bead game in the novel by Hermann Hesse. Magister Ludi, it's the Latin, for the master of the game. So if you know ultimate truth, if you know what ultimate truth is, you have to be a master of the game. Notice I don't say the master of the game. There are more than one. Everyone who knows ultimate truth is a master of that game, of that ultimate philosophical question. However, this is all a little tricky, isn't it? And I could sense, maybe if the audience were here in front of me, that there might be some discomfort at the way I'm coming across and there might be a certain discomfort about where I'm going to take this. How so? Well, it could look like I'm going in a direction where somebody, and who knows, it could be me, is going to stand there in front of you and tell you what ultimate truth is. Well, hold on a second, John. Shouldn't ultimate truth be something that everyone decides for themselves? 
something that they find innately on their own capacities, and certainly not something that would be stated to them by someone else. Isn't that so? Wouldn't you think so? After all, what kind of arrogant prick would come out before the world and say, I know ultimate truth, I know what ultimate truth is, and I'm going to tell you. Well, they would be telling you something that you can only know innately through yourself. It's not a truth you can acquire from anyone else, is it? By the way, just in case you're wondering, I'm not going to say what ultimate truth is in this talk. That's not what I want to get across. What I want to get across is what you need to know to accept ultimate truth. It comes with certain specific conditions. It comes actually with one very simple condition. Ultimate truth is unity and it is the same for everyone who finds it. We cannot agree on the truth always, and that's okay. We can agree to dis disagree, but let us not be separated by the truth. As long as we have our eyes and minds and hearts fixed together on truth, truth itself. Well, here again, I can see that I might be rustling some feathers. I don't know, really. I'm sitting here in the middle of the night trying to entertain myself. Doing a pretty good job, actually. And so this is what I say to you, my friends. Ultimate truth, whatever it is, must be unity. It's our unity. It must be something upon which we all agree. And when we have the foundation of solidarity together in ultimate truth, we have a power, a shared power, that stands behind the truth, whatever the truth may be about a particular event, person, situation, and so forth. See what I'm getting at? Now again, here comes the question, here comes the objection, and I love objections if they're civil and expressed in a respectful and amiable way. So here comes the objection. Well, what if someone who maybe isn't an arrogant prick, comes out and says, I know what ultimate truth is. And you disagree. Who's wrong? Actually, no one's wrong. What I've just said simply raises a problem that comes up when you're considering ultimate truth. Who am I or you or anyone to dictate to anyone else what ultimate truth is? Yet, imagine if we had an agreement on ultimate truth and we allow disagreements of various kinds about the truth, Samvridi Satya. But what if we had that agreement? What if we had unity in truth? And that is what truth is. Truth is unity. It's our unity. It's the unity of all truth seekers. It's not what you're looking for. It's where you come from. Paramata Satya. I'm not going to make any grandiose statement 
about what ultimate truth is or what I think it is. My intention here is to talk about how you would accept it if someone else said it to you. You see? That's the crux of the matter. And I can respect your reservations. Absolutely. You might say, well, hey dude, that's what you think ultimate truth is. But I have my own idea about what it is. And so we don't agree. But ultimate truth is that upon which we agree. There can only be one ultimate truth. Paramatha, Satya. The supreme thing. The truth of the supreme thing. And what is the supreme thing? Well, I told you, I'm not going to tell you. But I will tell you something about it. It's material. And at this moment, having said that, and don't worry, I'll shut up soon. Having said that, I happily invite you to consider this. In the living gnosis today, there's no talk about anything spiritual or spirit. See, when you talk about spirit, unfortunately, when I talk about it, when anyone does, it engages a number of files in the NLP of the human animal. And inevitably, these files bring up references, and one of the references is the dichotomy of spirit and matter. So all through philosophy, going back to the Vedic roots, you find this dichotomy of spirit and matter. Spirit being from the Latin word spiritus. And what is the denotation? What are the denotations of spirit as opposed to matter? Well, spirit is immaterial, isn't it? And spirit is something like, some people would define it as disembodied consciousness. Pure consciousness is not material. It's spirit. That's completely wrong. Pure consciousness is material. Everything is material. And there's the mystery. So, in the language that I use today, speaking as a living Gnostic, I never talk about spirit, and I insist that anyone who does is delusional. There is no disembodied, immaterial consciousness, and there never has been, and never will be. Am I boring you? Could be. So I'll see if I can wrap it up here. Wrap up the game. Like a pool hustler who takes the table on every shot. Like Magister Ludi. I'll see if I can wrap it up. Whatever ultimate truth is, as distinguished from the truth, which is particular, unless we know it and can agree upon it, then we, of the truth core, will be lacking the unity we need to pull off success in this battle, in overcoming the Great Reset, and all the other perverse nonsense that's coming from the globalist masterminds. So I guess what I'm saying to conclude, 
I guess what I'm doing is propositioning you. I'm inviting you to agree with me that ultimate truth is the same for all of us and that the condition of accepting it is to know that, to know that it's unity. No matter who happens to be the one who comes out and says what it is, it doesn't matter who says it. There's not just one Magister Ludi, there's not just one master of the game. I reckon you might find this talk disappointing. You might sense in some way that I'm letting you down. I don't intend to let you down. And I'm not just being provocative, but in a way, of course, I am. Because the question, what is ultimate truth, is provocative, isn't it? It carries a certain ping, doesn't it? One thing you know for certain is you don't want someone else telling you what ultimate truth is, do you? You want it to be something that you find through the deepest innate knowing of your existence, don't you? And that's how everyone finds it. But that is not how everyone expresses it. It's really tough what I'm saying. You can consider it a demonstration of tough love. And I don't fault you in the least if you're put off by it. That being so, I'll do my best to leave you on a positive note. I can happily assure you that you can divest your mind entirely of metaphysical speculation about truth, ultimate truth. Don't bother. Metaphysical and philosophical speculation won't get you there. What does get you there? An act of beholding. The foundation of the mysteries was an act of beholding something material. And on that experience, the Gnostics founded their ultimate sense of truth, aletheia. So am I saying, if you haven't had that ultimate mystical experience of beholding whatever, that you don't know ultimate truth. No. There's a factor of trust here, my friends. There's a factor of respect. And the happy truth is that if you respect the testimony of those who had had that experience, then you have the opportunity to consider the ultimate truth upon which we can all agree. So the ultimate truth is not a metaphysical proposition. It's more like the basis of a plot. Just think of a story, a narrative. A good story that holds together from beginning through the middle into the end, has a solid plot. Ultimate truth is the plot of a narrative. It comes in a narrative. So the good news is, the narrative is there for everyone to consider. And if you don't like the narrative, then go on your own journey to find ultimate truth, or you may 
think you have it already. But the narrative is the test. Ultimate truth comes in a narrative. It is the plot factor for the narrative. And there is only one narrative on this planet that carries that plot. Enough said. And I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.